Last week, he sent his defense minister, this time Volodymyr Zelensky, in person making the trip to Washington to try and convince Republicans to lift objections to a desperately needed financial lifeline. That's not the furthest Ukraine's president has been in the last days. Zelensky traveling all the way to Buenos Aires, nominally to attend the inauguration of new president Javier Milai, but more importantly, to lobby the pro-Milai, pro-Trump leader of Hungary, Viktor Orban, who's got uh, France and Germany crying uncle, perhaps, on releasing frozen EU funds so that he'll lift his uh, veto threat on Thursday's uh, European Union summit, extending uh, a lifeline for Ukraine. Uh, no other way to keep Ukraine's deadlocked uh, campaign against Russia alive? How frozen is that front line? What's the alternative to a war that's marking its 10th anniversary, 10 years and counting? Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're looking at Zelensky's last ditch pleas with us from Kyiv, uh, former NATO political officer Samantha de Bendern, associate fellow at the think tank Chatham House. Thank you so much for joining us. Good evening. From Strasbourg, Viola von Kramen Taubedel, member of the European Parliament for the Hello, German Green us. Party. Welcome back to the show. Hello, good evening from Strasbourg. Craig Kapitas, contributing editor to The Daily Piece. You've been writing on this very topic this Tuesday. We'll talk more about that. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. And uh, international affairs editor Kedavon Gorgistani. Hey, Francois. Good to see you. The uh, France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. This time, no joint session of Congress for Volodymyr Zelensky. Instead, it was closed door meetings and quiet huddles to try and uh, whip votes and convince Congress to lift objections to extending a $50 billion li financial lifeline for Ukraine before December the 31st. Uh, no miracles, however, coming out of a sit-down with the pro-Trump Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. What the Biden administration seems to be asking for is billions of additional dollars with no appropriate oversight, no clear strategy to win, and, and none of the answers that I think the American people are owed. I have also made very clear from day one that our first condition on any national security supplemental spending package is about our own national security first. The border is an absolute catastrophe, and this is because of the policies of this White House and this administration. We had 12,000 illegal crossings on one day last week alone, on Wednesday. So first off, Kedavon Gorgistani, can we kind of just first fact check what he said? No appropriate oversight of the money that goes to Ukraine? Well, uh, the White House is saying that that's not the case and that there is. <coughs> now, there is a question about uh, giving more information, uh, asking the Ukrainians to uh, give more uh, information or uh, share more when it comes to their strategy on the ground. We'll talk about uh, what's happening on the ground uh, later. Uh, but the way he has framed it, the, the Republicans haven't been talking about that much. It's really about the border. It's not so much. There are a few Republicans who are ideologically dead set against giving Ukraine a more aid, but that's not the majority. The majority is blocking this because of the border. It has very little really to do uh, with Ukraine for most of them. And what are your sources telling you? Well, it's a mixed bag. One of my uh, sources on the Hill that I was speaking to a few days ago, so he might have changed his mind uh, by now, was saying it doesn't look good, but it's a game of chicken. And at some point, one of the sides is uh, going to uh, give up, give in. Uh, his worry was not that eventually this uh, funding is going to pass at some point. His worry was that it was not going to pass now, and it's going to pass somewhere down the road in 2024. And that is a problem for Ukraine for two reasons. One, it's because the White House is saying and very clearly that the funding is running out by the end of this calendar year. The second one is the message that it sends. If they wait two months to pass that funding, it already sends a message that support for Ukraine is not as steadfast as it used to be, even if in the end the funding and the military aid eventually happens. All right. It's not just a uh, classic horse trading, the kind you see in Washington over border controls with Mexico versus uh, Ukraine aid. Uh, Pro-Trump Ohio Senator J.D. Vance uh, uh, saying Sunday, America's best interest, quote, is to accept Ukraine is going to have to cede some territory to the Russians. 
Uh, he's not alone, Craig Capitas. You spoke to Tennessee Congressman Democrat Steve Cohen, who warns Congress won't come together to help Ukraine anytime soon. That's right. The cavalry's not coming. Simple as that. And all this talk about the money, bless your hearts, it's nonsense. What's been going on for the past 654 days, and you hear this from everyone off the record, is that the Americans and the EU have not been giving them enough. It's this deep pockets, short arms, no guts. We're giving Ukraine just enough money to survive, but we're not giving enough money to win the game. You know, let's not disturb these people in their natural habitat. We did the same thing in Georgia. That's what's going on here. And over <clears throat> at places like the Central Intelligence Agency, they're just thrilled about this because they're seeing Russia's army getting defense traded. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, today there was um, uh, the uh, U.S. administration saying 315,000 Russians killed since uh, killed February of, injured. Or, or injured since February of 2022. Yeah, and we can't even believe these numbers because every number coming out of Ukraine is, is sclerotic, wrapped in secrecy, and, and the politicians are scared of telling the truth because of the political consequences. It's a mess. Democracy is at stake here, and everyone is hiding under the nearest rock and making excuses. Full stop. All right, the writing was on the wall at the end of last month when Germany's largest selling uh, tabloid, Bild, cited German government sources who claimed Washington and Berlin, quote, plan to provide the exact quantity and quality of arms to ensure Ukraine can hold the front and have a strong negotiating position, but not enough to fully liberate its territory. Despite denials uh, from both Berlin and D.C., the front page of Monday's Tagesspiel asks, is support for Ukraine collapsing? I I'll put the question to you, Viola van Kramen Taubedel. Well, unfortunately, um, we have heard similar voices. Uh, we have heard similar um, predictions. But what that means is really terrifying. Uh, some of uh, the guests have said that the arms race is in full swing. It's a race against time. And uh, the more we wait, the more costly in the end it will become. And I'm not sure that everyone is really aware of what does it mean. It's not about um, occupation of territory. It's really about a terror regime, a regime which rapes women, uh, which deported children, uh, which actually wants to um, eradicate the Ukrainian nation uh, from the map. And if so we do not have an appropriate uh, military answer to this, Russia will not stop uh, so, at so, the Polish so Viola, border, will not stop at the Romanian border. So, Viola, what to make of uh, uh, build sources saying that uh, Berlin and Washington are ready to give enough for Kyiv to be able to negotiate, but not enough to win the war. Not even to negotiate, because you need the other side. Putin is not willing to negotiate, because he so knows... So you're saying it's accurate. He is at, at the moment, I think he's still willing to win the war. And with this supply of ammunition and the supply of military equipment, he can just simply sit down and wait. And that is what he's going to do. Uh, he will not accept uh, any kind of a half peace on, on his way uh, towards the west of Ukraine. And of course, he will swallow in the end Moldova, part of Georgia, and maybe. So why doesn't attack, why doesn't uh, Olaf Scholz why doesn't Olaf Scholz go all in? If we're why is he not giving more for that Ukraine? That is exactly this is our question as well. We don't know. I know. We have no idea why the, uh, the Chancery is so reluctant uh, to provide more weapons, other category of weapons, as the long-range uh, towers, as, as other uh, better quality, the Leopard 2. I mean, there were many other European member states who were willing to supply those uh, Leopards to Ukraine. It was all rejected. Every time you heard a different uh, excuse, there was no political will, especially from Washington and, um, and Berlin, uh, to really make uh, Ukraine win. And that is, as I said, uh, it's very scary when you think of the consequences. Of, of the consequences. <laughs> we had Minsk, too. And if 
uh, of the, the consequences. consequences for us and the European Union. Right. Uh, so we, we have we have uh, we have. Theater. We have uh, two panel members in the studio raising their hands to answer your question, Viol. But I'm going to give first crack uh, to uh, Samantha de Bentern uh, in Kiev. Why, why isn't the West all in or hasn't been all in since February of 2022? Well, I don't think the West really realizes what's at stake here, that it's not about defending Ukraine. It's about defending Europe from an enemy that has made very clear that um, he actually intends to go further. One of the wonderful things about uh, analyzing Vladimir Putin is he always explains in advance what he intends to do. He published a few articles before he invaded Ukraine. He published this in 2021. This year, he gave a wonderful speech about 10 days ago in which he explained that Russia's borders are, are basically the same as the Russian Empire plus the USSR all rolled into one. So if I were in Poland or in the Baltic Republics today or in Hungary, even in Hungary, I wouldn't be feeling very safe. But um, one of the things that Ukrainians are saying that, that is a message that I've been getting in practically every single meeting is, OK, we're very grateful for the aid that we're getting. But unfortunately, many of the weapons that you're giving us, that you're accusing us of not having actually work, um, used properly on the battlefield, often arrive in a very dire state of repair. And we're spending months getting them back Getting them functional, you have um, armoured vehicles that are arriving without the proper weaponry, without the proper guns. You have other weapons arriving that are, that are rusty and need complete reconditioning. And only about 30% of what is being, off being, off being offered has actually arrived. So, so, so on that point, Samantha, what, what do you package? think of the, um, of the disagreement that's been highlighted in the U.S. press the last couple of weeks uh, 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 between the military leadership in Washington and in Kyiv over the strategy for this counteroffensive? Well, what the message that I'm getting is that General Zaluzhny, who is the um, commander in chief, did not want to start the offensive when it was actually started because he felt he did not have enough weapons, he didn't have the air defense systems that he had required and he felt were necessary for the kind of counteroffensive that was necessary to recapture territory. And that you know, the, the the victories in Kherson and Kharkiv last year were very much due to the fact that the Russians had been completely unprepared for the Ukrainians to, to, to take back territory as easily, easily as they did. But by the time it came to the counter offense, and for the. Oh, we seem to be freezing up there with. They needed uh, with the Kiev. kind of offense that they didn't have. I'm right. sorry? No, we're having we're having a, the the Skype gods are, are are only partially with us, Samantha De Bender, Kedavon Gorgistani. Well, there I want to double down on uh, what she said because if you look back at uh, the war and how the U.S. sent those weapons, there are two things. One is remember those discussions of we're not going to give them Patriot missiles. Okay, fine, we're going to give them. We're not going to give them Abrams tanks. Fine, we're going to give them. All of these things took months, the latest, the attack M's, the F-16s. But For the counter-argument the ca the counter to that is you needed to get public opinion on board. Yes, but when you're talking about a stalemate on the ground, they're not, you know, uh, winning well enough compared to what we've given them. I looked at the dates. First Abram tanks arriving in October, first used attack M's in October. Those things took time to arrive. There's one thing to announce the military package, then there is how long it takes to get there. And that's normal. It takes time. But there was also time taken in this back and forth of, at first, we're saying no. Then finally, after a few months, we're saying yes. And the other thing uh, is that the U.S. is also really focusing now on more aid. But there's still a lot of stuff that was announced that hasn't arrived. And that makes also a huge difference in uh, what some of the Republicans are using now, which is Look how much we've sent and look at the results on the ground. We're not seeing enough payback to what we've given them. Yeah, Craig Capitas, that contention by uh, uh, Mike Johnson there, we heard at the outset that uh, uh, the Biden administration, uh, quote, doesn't have a uh, clear plan. Nobody has a clear plan. This is a war that's being euph euphemistically described as a stalemate that, that stinks of the air that you find inside a coffin. All of this stuff about material and, and Abrams tanks and Leopard tanks and this, that, and the other thing, this is, this is performance altruism, boys and girls. 
There, the, the, you talk to any, if, if we had a, a general in here who could speak on the record, they're going to tell you that there's no way to do this kind of attacking without air power. No NATO army in their right mind would do what, what Zelensky and his heroes have done in Ukraine without air power, full air power, full electronic power. But these crazy Ukrainians, they decided to go and do it. And now everyone's running for cover. It is shameful. The, the, the moral uh, obtusity of this is, is beyond belief. The hypocrisy. And, and I'm sorry. You, uh, I, I've spent the past week talking off and on the record with people intimately involved in this war for this story. Deep background. And what we're seeing, what we've seen for the past 650-some days is nothing more than performance altruism on the part of the West. And so let me ask you, the 50, because there's the immediate needs, the yeah. $50 billion from Washington, the 50 billion euros, which we'll talk about in a moment from, from, uh, from Europe, how important are they right now? It's kicking the proverbial can down the road. Of course it's important. But, you know, it's, it's like something out of Dickens. Sir, can I have a little bit more? They don't have enough to win. They're short of money. They're short of medicine. They're short of armor. They're short, uh, they're short of guns. They're short of ammo. They're short of food. Go down the, we can go down the list here. It's not a matter of, oh, well, if we give them $65 billion more, everything's going to be fine. No. You know what the estimate is to win this war and, and rebuild Ukraine? The off-the-record estimate minimum, minimum, $750 billion. Minimum. Right, that's rebuilding, of course. Uh, no, that's... and that's per putting money in to actually kick the Russians. Right. In, in the meantime, uh, it all seems to hinge on one man, and that man is the Prime Minister of Hungary, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. Uh, last Sunday, attending uh, the inauguration of uh, Javier Milai, was the trip uh, to Buenos Aires worth it? Argentinian TV capturing the moment during Javier Milai's inauguration when Viktor Orban and uh, Zelensky engage uh, directly. Uh, we don't hear what they're saying, but I'm sure Ketevan Gorgestani reads lips. What <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for putting me on the stop there. I do not read lips, especially I don't know what language they're talking in. Could have been English, Russian. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm not gonna <laughs> but try. Your, 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 your thoughts on this? That it's all it all hinges on Viktor Orban? I mean, not all, but of course he's part of the equation. I mean, I don't think that Zelensky would have made the trip solely to be at the inauguration of uh, Millet. I think that the goal was to see other leaders, and one of those that are very important uh, is uh, Viktor Orban, because right now, yes, we're focused on the U.S., because the U.S. is a huge uh, part of this equation, but the Europeans also, uh, you're seeing more and more, you're seeing a Eurosceptic in uh, the Netherlands, in Slovakia, the pro-Russian new prime minister. Uh, Hungary is, of course, uh, the most uh, pro-Russian country in uh, the EU, and Zelensky knows that. He knows that he needs to convince the Republicans uh, in uh, the United States, and he knows that uh, in Europe it's not all uh, one already. He knows that he is also seeing Seeing in Europe sort of divisions yeah. coming together. Ahead of Thursday's EU summit, Politico reporting that the European Commission is set to unblock 10 billion dollars in 10 million euros, excuse me, in frozen aid uh, for, for Hungary. Uh, is that the price to pay Viola von Kramen Taubadel? Uh, give, uh, throw uh, Hungary a bone the way that Emmanuel Macron decided to invite Viktor Orban for dinner? last week to the Elysee Palace. It's what you got to do if you want to get this over the line. Well, the problem is that even for this high price, he got 900 uh, million unfrozen for a different uh, topic. And now, um, allegedly, it says 10 billion for implementing some judiciary reform where nobody really has a clue what uh, the Orban government has actually done. But <clears throat> with this money, we are not really sure what this entails. Does that mean only green light for the macro financial framework for the MFF? Or does it also entail the beginning of the uh, accession talks? So far, there's a clear, uh, let's say, uh, confusedness about 
what was actually the deal about? And does it mean there needs to be another, um, let's say, package on the Western Balkans? Is there anything else? Is Moldova, Georgia included into this? So we speak about 10 billion, but we don't really understand and don't really know what this package means uh, for the enlargement process. And I think this blackmailing of Orban should be stopped. I think we should have found a different way, something intergovernmental without um, relying on his, uh, on his blackmailing process. I think this is extremely unfortunate that the Commission has given but in. But Thursday, as you... Uh, this I was going to say Thursday yeah, is go going to be an EU summit, and, and, again. and there's a unanimity rule, and uh, uh, you have to uh, uh, make deals in order to get it over the line. Well, I mean, you have a new government in, in Poland, uh, which definitely helps. I think Fico will rather be quiet because he needs the money. So I think uh, one sh should have uh, chosen a, a different procedure and maybe has taken this one out and said, OK, we're going to rule this without, uh, uh, without Putin's men in the, in the EU. And uh, in the long run, I think we should really find a mechanism how to kick uh, Orban out if he stays in power. And of course, we have all the, always the Article 7 uh, procedure. We could have used that too. Uh, to dismiss his uh, his voting rights, uh, but nothing was really tried. Uh, everyone thought a compromise might be safer, but I think this just encouraged Orban to go ahead, uh, and will, he will never accept uh, for the next month um, that the accession talks for Ukraine will be open. So let's wait and see. My guess is uh, that it's only about the money, but not about the uh, broader enlargement process. And to Craig Kapitas's point about uh, the, uh, the fact that even 50 billion euros, that first part of what's at stake in this Thursday summit, before you even talk about EU candidacy for, for Ukraine, uh, uh, that that is just a drop in the bucket. And uh, you, you're not going to see this. The, the, in places like Germany, where the Constitutional Court has just uh, uh, reined in the government over uh, its fiscal rules, uh, the money's never going to come. I think the 15 billion are actually safe. Uh, I think that was negotiated before. Uh, what I've heard from the Commission, this is for four years. To be honest, it's definitely not enough. This is what Craig and others uh, were saying. We need much, much more. This is just to keep the uh, country running uh, when the war is going on. That is just um, a drop uh, in, in the water which we actually need. So 50 billion is good. It's good for Ukraine to have a security on, on planning, on fiscal planning, but in general, this will be not sufficient. What angers the Ukraines is the, the, the acrid aroma of the West's hypocrisy. You know, Ukraine's friends and allies continue to underwrite Russia's brutality and information war by buying discounted oil. India, you know, they can't get off this addiction of discounted oil. Over the first nine months, first three quarters of this year, Russians made $50 billion, $50 billion from their friends and neighbors here in the West and around the world. And on top of that, they cannot convince anyone in Europe to release the 300 and some billion euros that are sitting in the bank of <clears throat> seized assets from the from the Russian Central Bank. They're livid over this. Uh, Samantha de Bender, and uh, we could talk about uh, the, the, the oil money, particularly as this week uh, Bulgaria scrapped the idea of uh, a, a transit tax for Russian gas. Your thoughts on, uh, on, on, on uh, what the EU can do more? Well, first of all, the EU can apply sanctions a lot more strictly. I was speaking to a drone manufacturer today who is doing a lot of reverse engineering on drones, that um, Russian drones that fall on Ukrainian territory. And he was saying that he is still shocked that in practically every single drone he has reverse engineered, he's found European and American components. How they're getting into Russia, your guess is as good as mine. So that's one thing, is that the sanctions are not working. Russia's war machine is still using Western components to manufacture its weapons. Secondly, look at um, liquid national, uh, natural gas. The European Union has imported over 6 billion euros worth of liquid natural gas 
from Russia into the EU this year. It is not sanctioned. Look at um, uranium, uranium that is bought from Rosatom, the Russian nuclear energy company from state or organization. The United States imports 50% of its uranium for its nuclear power stations from Russia. If we do not apply sanctions on Russia in a way that actually really does damage it's going to continue feeding this war machine. And sanctions also need to be applied on um, secondary sanctions to countries that are continuing to do business with Russia. This is the message I'm getting from Ukraine. This is, this is the message I'm getting from other people who are looking at the sanctions issue a, a lot more carefully. I'm not sure that the Skype is still working. I'm seeing my own image freezing. So we can um, hear you loud and clear. Talking? <laughs> Good. Good. So yes, sanctions are an issue. Um, oil, gas, and components um, um, for the war machine that are entering into Russia. Remember, Russia has a double defense budget for next year. 40% of Russia's budget will be spent on defense in 2024. Um, it is preparing for a long war, a long war that a lot of people in Ukraine are saying will not stop with Ukraine. The um, Polish, a Polish general said last week that NATO will have three years to prepare for war with Russia if Ukraine fails in this war. Another thing about funding and, and US money and European money that is going to fund Ukraine, what is happening to the money from the US budget that is going to fund Ukraine? It is actually being used to buy US weapons that US, the US and defense industry is actually doing very well. It's making money. If the US defense industry makes money, it pays more taxes, which go back into the US budget. So again, all this talk about you know taxpayers' money not being well used. Well, taxpayers' money is actually being used to finance companies that are then going to continue paying more taxes. And this is the message that, for some reason, um, the, the, the American government is not getting to its own people. And this is something that the Ukrainians I speak to are extremely frustrated about. And and not not notwithstanding, of course, that their frustration over the the, the slow trickle in of weapons. So when they're criticized for their counteroffensive, they're saying, well, of course we couldn't do everything we hope to achieve. We, we, haven't, we haven't even... Right, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the Skype connection a little bit choppy there, Samantha De Bender, and apologies for that. Um, but you mentioned an important point, which is, uh, again, this to and fro, uh, and perhaps the beginning of finger pointing over how the counteroffensive, which was sold, uh, to the public has gone. Uh, the New York Times this Tuesday reporting how Russia has been able to dig in after the initial gain, for instance, of the village of Robotin, that's some 70 kilometers from the Black Sea near Zaboricha. Ukraine's uh, uh, U.S. trained 47th Brigade taking huge losses. Um, other units, striker armored personnel carriers, German Leopard tanks destroyed, and uh, uh, Russia's defenses proving far stronger. Uh, than uh, had uh, uh, been estimated uh, by the United States, rather than a victory, quote, Robotine turning into a, a bloody slog. Um, when you were at that conference, uh, we we're talking with uh, military folks. Um, th okay, so option one is you fight to the end. Option two is you sue for peace or some kind of a... But is there an option three where I've seen it talked about where um, the Ukrainians dial down for now counteroffensives and build up uh, their forces. Ukraine in two years won't have enough bodies to put in the trenches to stop the Russian onslaught. That's military fact number one that people need to think about. The most important thing the military people talk about at this point, on top of the bang, bang, shoot, shoot, is that the West is losing the information war to Putin. And that's really hurting the military operation tremendously. They say it's as vital as what's going on uh, on the ground. Um, every what, do you mean by, what do you mean by losing the information war? To, to uh, Putin's uh, trolls on the Internet, social media, disinformation campaigns, as Congressman uh, Cohn was telling me, uh, Putin's trolls helping Putin. Uh, uh, or, or, I'm sorry, Putin's trolls helping uh, Donald Trump. <clears throat> get uh, get reelected. Uh, th this is a big issue uh, uh, back in the United States using social media, TikTok, Instagram, all that other stuff. But militarily, what every military officer says 
There is no way Ukraine is going to win this war unless NATO air power comes in and takes out the Russians on Ukrainian territory. Full stop. Uh, that, that, that is their bottom line. And, and what the, you ask them about, well, they're making this blitz around this town or that town, and the generals look at you and say, it's meaningless. It's performance art without air power. And people can't seem to get this through their thick heads, which is why the Ukrainians are trying to do a new information push. Uh, Viola von Kramen Telbedel, you heard Ketavon Gorgistani uh, talk about the lapse between when uh, announcements are made and when actual armament arrives uh, to the uh, front line. Uh, what about those Ukrainian pilots that were trumpeted to be uh, prepared for for? for training on F-16 fighter jets. What's the latest on that? Is that still an issue or has that gone away? Well, to be honest, I'm surprised as well. I've heard that uh, there are some Danish fighters. I've heard that this uh, training, the exercise for the pilots is still ongoing. But to be honest, I'm not that close uh, to the Ukrainian uh, military representative. I have been several times to Ukraine. I also have been to the front line speaking to different battalions, but I'm not in, in, in a daily exchange with, uh, with the militaries there. But yes, of course, I think everyone is uh, desperately awaiting that moment, uh, what was described here before, uh, without air defense, without air power, there is actually no um, no way that you're going to start a counter off offensive. But what should the Ukrainians do? Wait, wait until their land is even more mined. Wait until the Russians come into the offensive. Um, um, uh, performance again. I mean, for them, it was the last chance. Uh, they knew that they are not um, appropriately or adequately equipped. But uh, when the West is not willing uh, to bri provide them more, and when they, as, as, as the, the other guests have said, they delayed um, each and every delivery, each and every promised um, weapon category um, and <laughs> go back and, and debate it again and again. And, and, and so the, the and how, promises how have are the not attitudes being kept. Of, what, how have the attitudes of your constituents um, uh, evolved in the last to, two years? To be honest, it very much depends on to whom you speak. I have been to different schools and kids. The younger generation is much more away, uh, aware of the danger, of the risk, of the threat. And they are very grateful. They say thanks for fighting for uh, the liberation of Ukraine. So they are much more advanced in thinking, what does it mean for me, for my generation, if Putin wins this war? They are uh, much more alarmed. I'm more afraid of some of the more uh, older generation, especially in, in, in Germany, in the eastern part of Germany, for whatever reason, they feel and they sympathize much more with Putin's uh, occupation of forces, with Putin's strength, uh, and that is a danger. And what was said before, this disinformation war, the propaganda, flies extremely well in, in some parts of Germany. And we saw the last uh, results of the IFD, of the right-wing party. And we are very much um, uh, worried and, and concerned about the upcoming um, elections here in the European Parliament. Imagine if they gain, if they receive 35 uh, percent, this would be a different Europe. And this would be a different um, parliamentary uh, democracy. And so we have to make sure this disinformation war is not being won uh, by Putin and his, uh, his allies. That's not easy, but we need to start. And for this, we also have to make sure that Ukraine is able to military win this war. And we are far away from that at the moment. Ahead of Thursday's EU summit, Lithuania's foreign minister uh, at a preparatory meeting spelling out the stakes uh, of, the, of this last summit of 2023. Probably it's the first time that um, we will gathering, we'll be gathering to uh, discuss Ukraine and test the limits of uh, as long as it takes. We've been promising Ukraine uh, for almost two years to support Ukraine uh, and uh, mentioning this phrase. Many of us have asked what it does it mean. Does it mean Ukrainian victory? 
uh, does it mean any other strategic goal? Uh, apparently, it means that as long as it takes, it, it is as long as we can agree. And if we cannot, uh, obviously that will have a huge repercussions, first of all in Ukraine, but not just there. As long as it takes, instead meeting as long as we can agree, get of on gorgeous time. <laughs> yeah, and that's a great <laughs> line, unfortunately, because uh, that was the question that's been asked, actually, to Joe Biden multiple times uh, by reporters, which is, how long does really, as long as it takes, last? Because you have been seeing this gradual uh, erosion of uh, the support, of uh, the unity, the bipartisan unity about uh, helping uh, Ukraine. And there was this worry that we were going to get to this point, that at some point there was going to be some topic, it's immigration, that would break the bipartisan support in uh, the United States, that there was going to be some EU policy uh, or EU disagreements. But, between... yeah, but when it comes to the U.S., that's understandable. The United States, after all, is far away. But here in Europe, this erosion that you describe. I think the Europeans, because we criticize the Americans often uh, for not understanding uh, Putin's mentality and how he functions and uh, always thinking, let's not, uh, you know, uh, trigger him. We are not going to send these missiles because we don't want to escalate. The <coughs> Europeans, you would expect, have a history that shows them that there is no negotiating with Putin. Nothing you do to not escalate will be used by Putin and put in a plus column for a uh, look at what the Europeans didn't do when they could have done it. He's never going to uh, see this as the Europeans not escalating. He doesn't care. And I think uh, that this is a moment of realization in uh, Europe that uh, they still to this day do not understand or do not want to understand that Putin doesn't function like a European leader. And that, I think, is something that, uh, as uh, she was saying, is surprisingly something maybe that the younger generation understands better than the older generation. Which you say is the opposite in the U.S. The generation oh, gap works the other way. Oh, absolutely. The, the, the overwhelming majority of Americans from every elected official I spoke with is absolutely clueless, clueless. They don't know Vladimir Putin from Pinocchio. They have no idea what's going on in the Ukraine. You hear this over and over. In fact, it's gotten so desperate that, that a number of Ukrainians, uh, along with, with Congressman Cohn and a few others, are, are now trying to bring a substantial number of Ukraine's 110,000 Baptists, evangelical Christians, to the United States to go tour uh, uh, the Bible Belt to try and get these MAGA Republicans to, 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 to turn the wagon around. Now, and, and Congressman Cohn and others have said, this is actually a, a great idea, but it might be too late in the game. So, Samantha DeBender, and you, you heard Viola von Kramen Talbadel talking about how uh, right now uh, the far right is making political hay on, uh, 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 on other issues. It's interesting that as we speak, the top story, both here in France and in the UK, is not Ukraine. It's, uh, it's about uh, uh, immigration bills putting the government in trouble. And in both places, uh, uh, the, the talk about migrants out is pushing uh, Ukraine out of the headlines. Yeah, well, there's, there's incomprehension over the fact that um, a few thousand um, unarmed women, children, and a few unarmed men are more scary to the Europeans and to the Americans than the world's largest nuclear arsenal, which is threatening them at their borders. There's just complete incomparison that, you know, I'm being, people are saying to me, don't you un what Putin doing? He has millions of men that can be mobilized. And you're afraid of, of these unarmed people who want to come and get a better life in Europe, who want to actually get jobs, or who are mainly f fleeing war. What on earth is wrong with you? And, and I, I think as an Estonian politician said about 10 days ago that he feels that Europe and America need another Pearl Harbor to really understand what the threat is. Uh -huh. and, and that is a regrettable statement. But view... view view from Kiev, where I, I'm sitting by window now, and I was hesitating about sitting by the window for this call in case there's another air raid, because 
we've had I've had air raids every single day since I've been here. Kiev is really well protected, but there's always that that that, that stray missile that might get through. But this is um, we are now here in Ukraine. There is a war which is of Second World War, uh, or First World War, and Second World War proportions, where one country is attacking another and trying to completely take over its territory. Nice. Not only take it over, but incorporate it in its own country with complete disregard for human life, human life in the country it's attacking, and the human life of its old soldiers. This is what we are facing here in Europe in 2023. And European and British and American governments are worried about these unarmed migrants. It's absolutely, completely absurd. Right, before we go, Viola van Kramen, I'm going to ask you to take out your crystal ball and tell us what you're expecting uh, from this EU summit. <laughs> well, to be honest, I've asked around and I've not heard any positive <laughs> Uh, prediction or forecasting so I don't know what you would like to hear um, I don't see there's any optimism flying around here um, I hope that we can prevent the catastrophe I hope that we can at least find some how to say pressure or some magic box uh, which finally let Orban not veto on the uh, start of the accession talk for Ukraine, which is really, really crucial for all of us, for the EU, because it's a merit-based process. And technically, Ukraine has done everything which is needed uh, to, to start the process, Moldova even more so. And so for the world outside of the EU, it would be a significant signal to say, yes, you're welcoming and yes, your fight was worth. Um, but whether this will be acknowledged uh, by Orban and, and his people, I don't know. I think this should have um, consequences, any kind of sanctions, any kinds of political impacts. And even here, I'm not so sure that this is understood by everyone. <laughs> So we have people who are critical and skeptical towards enlargement, and I've heard they're hiding behind Orban. Uh, so he is clearly singled out. He's the only one speaking up against this uh, Ukraine case. But whether there are other skeptics also, I've heard about Austria, they're making the case with Western Balkan, Slovakia, and so on. Whether this is true or whether this is just an excuse to make sure that uh, we can't do anything about Orban, because he's not alone, I'm, I'm not so sure. But it is complex, it is complicated, and uh, I hope that we do not fail, because this would be the absolutely wrong signal to the world outside of the EU. Viola van Kramen Tabadel, so many thanks for joining us from Strasbourg. I want to thank Samantha de Bender and for being with us uh, from the Ukrainian capital, uh, Kiev. Uh, Craig Kapitas, Kedavon Gorgistani, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.